Ira Pastor here, the uh, longevity and aging ambassador for the IDW show, the uh, wonderful new show for uh, featuring interviews with uh, humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping the world and uh, helping to serve as uh, inspiration for uh, the really big ideas for humanity. And I'm really excited today to have uh, Dr. Michael Lusgarten uh, joining us. Uh, Dr. Lusgarten is the, the author of a really fascinating book uh, titled The Microbial Burden, Major Cause of Age-Related age Disease and What We Can Do to Fight Back. Uh, Mike has a, a PhD in physiology from the University of Texas, and he's spent the last several years uh, researching uh, the microbiome, uh, but also spending a lot of time studying the, uh, the serum metabolome, which we'll get into in a, in a little bit as we talk about his work in biologic age tracking, uh, focusing on uh, areas like muscle mass and sarcopenia, weight, physical function and aging uh, at the Tufts uh, Human Nutrition Center uh, on aging. So, uh, Mike, thanks so much for uh, joining me today, especially on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, thanks, Ira. Thanks, Ira. Notice we didn't plan it closer to 6.30, right? Then I, <laughs> and I'm, I generally don't uh, watch football except when it gets the playoff time. So, yeah, definitely going to watch, but yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, Mike, let's let's jump right in. Uh, I'll hand you the floor. Uh, the, the we can start out. I'd just love to hear more about who you are, your background, how you got interested in in science and research primarily, and then ultimately, you know, how the the microbiome uh, fell into your lap as an area that you really wanted to spend time focusing on uh, in terms of your you know, long term research and development goals. Sure. All right. So I'll start. Uh, when I was about uh, 20, I'll go back to when I was about 24. And uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And long story short, I read uh, a book by Roy Walford. I'm sure you're familiar with Roy Walford. Sure. And he wrote Beyond the 120 Year Diet. And I thought, this is it. If I'm going to wake up every day passionate about doing something, I don't want to die. I don't want to age. I want to live as long as I can, as healthily as possible. So uh, I also had an interest in biochemistry at the time, uh, like basically what I'm doing now, um, well, part, in part what I'm doing now, but, you know, this idea of, you know, measuring as much stuff in your blood as possible and then by quantifying your biological age based on that. So I took those two things and thought, all right, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get a second bachelor's degree in biochem, and then I'm going to go to grad school. Um, so I ended up going, as you mentioned, to the University of Texas Health Science Center in part because at that time... The oxidative stress theory of aging was very popular. And uh, so I thought, this is it. It's oxidative stress. That's what I'm going to study. And that's where I'm going to make my dent. So um, yeah, so uh, fast forwarding through that, I was obviously very interested in, in the oxidative stress theory of aging during that time. And then towards the end of it, I thought, well, I want to get closer to my goal of uh, basically the metabolome and start studying stuff in the blood and getting away from studying mice and, and aging models and into humans. So to do that, I joined a lab uh, at Tufts that specializes in uh, basically sarcopenia in humans. Uh, so um, at that time, there wasn't any metabolomic stuff going on in the lab. And I joined the lab because the, uh, the PI, Roger Fielding, he had grant funding to study the metabolome and actually young subjects and actually triathletes. But nobody knew how to, how to analyze the data. Nobody knew how to write it up for publication. So I walked into it completely green. So um, it took me uh, two or three years of banging my head off the wall and getting many papers rejected and not knowing how to write it up and properly analyze that kind of data because we're talking about 300 or plus metabolites. How do you tell that story? How do you tell a story if you've got 60 or 70? That, I, it, so anyway, it, it took me a while, but once I got over that hump, um, uh, it, it was kind of smooth sailing with publications from then, but long story short is, uh, uh, it, um, a story started to emerge that many of these gut bacteria related metabolites in the blood were related to things like lean mass and, and, and uh, muscle mass and measures of physical function, both in young and in older adults. So with that in mind, I uh, wrote and was lucky enough or fortunate enough to have a few grants funded looking at the role of the gut microbiome on lean, ma lean mass, muscle mass, physical fun function during aging. So that's how I basically evolved into the microbiome 
And then the more I started to investigate the microbiome and, and how potentially it could affect distal tissues. I mean, we're talking about the gut, how can it affect the brain or muscle or, or liver? Um, and I noticed that other fields, especially in patho pathological situations like uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or, um, um, uh, or other stuff without going down that rabbit hole, that, that it was you know, basically an altered gut microbiome composition and functions, increased intestinal permeability, and then an increase in circulating microbial products that would be associated with all kinds of bad stuff, inflammation, decreased tissue function, increased uh, fat in tissue, which is not where it should be. So I decided to go full force into that, and the book actually emerged out of that. So it's basically been a sequential uh, evolution of, of research. Um, and it's interesting when you say, you know, that I want to study the mi microbiome going forward. Who knows, in 10 years, I may have evolved past this and gone into, you know, immunojuvenation, you know, rejuvenation of the immune system as a means for combating where our immune system declines in terms of the war against the microbes. So, um, so yeah, so that's where I am now. And uh, on the side, I do the things like measuring my own blood and studying my own diet and trying to optimize my biological age. So I've got both, both uh, science and personal and professional, you know, going full steam towards uh, living as long as I possibly can. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I really, you know, in reading your book, I really appreciate that about you because while you do do a great job about getting into the science, you're one of the, the few people out there that really uh, makes a good effort in talking about, you know, something that's dear to my heart, you know, coming out of the pharma industry for many decades, uh, translation. You know, people don't always think too much nowadays about translational possibilities of these things we're working on. And we hear an endless array of, you know, mouse studies, but ultimately what this all means. And you do a really uh, great job, I think, uh, in the book on uh, talking about future possibilities, uh, as well as, you know, the short term, the actionable items today, things that you're doing in your own, you know, we'll call biohacking or, you know, personalized nutrition, what have you. Uh, and you also, in the book, you know, uh, you, you diversify, you talk a lot about the gut, of course, but uh, you, you know, you make notes that, that the microbiome is vast. Uh, there is the skin microbiome, the the oral cavity. So, you know, if you could talk about, you know, some of your thoughts uh, for the audience about, you know, what are some of these translational opportunities today? Uh, some of the things that you do uh, and you write a lot about in terms of uh, your daily nutritional habits and, and things like this in terms of diet, but also some of what you see as five, 10, 15 year sort of milestones out there and where this is all potentially going because, you know, right now, you know, 2019, we're slowly but surely beginning to see, you know, some of the first steps of uh, microbiome cocktails and so forth being developed as drugs, but there's just so much else happening and you really focus on a lot of that. So if you can maybe talk a little bit more about that for the audience, that'd be great. So in terms of the uh, using um, probiotic cocktails, um, so there's an interesting study by uh, Iran Siegel, but all right, so long story short is um, uh, they showed that uh, uh, gut microbiome can predict glycemic responses. The long story short uh, is, I don't think the I don't think the approach of giving probiotic cocktails to everyone is going to work. What it's going to have to happen, what's probably going to have to happen is, um, we're going to be using machine learning or AI based algorithms to use your genome and then your microbiome and then you know quantitate your levels of physical activity and what your diet is and based on all that here are the microbes that maybe you should be taking, or maybe that would be able to colonize based on all those factors. So that's the, that's the road that I want to get to, whether directly or indirectly through my own research or others. But um, so, okay, so that's in terms of that. Targeted supplementation. Now, in terms of my own personal approach, um, uh, it's evolved through years of blood testing. And actually, I'm going to do Ubiome, you know, which tests uh, the stool microbiome for the fourth time sometime this month. So I'm still trying to optimize that. But um, I noticed that, uh, so I tried going vegan and I checked the effect on my biomarkers and it wasn't optimal. Things like triglycerides were double what they had been. My HDL actually went down probably 40%, which these are two things going in, in the wrong direction. So then I added fish back into my diet and that improved my triglycerides and HDL. Everything else is basically the same. So I realized it's something related to vegetarian uh, would probably be optimal for my biomarkers. Now, that being said, I still occasionally eat meat. I still occasionally eat cheese. 
but these aren't everyday, everyday uh, things. So, um, and in relatively small amounts, I'm not eating a 16 pound steak. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then the, the core of it is based on this very high fiber diet. Now the RDA recommends 20 to 30 grams of fiber a day, which in my, my eyes is laughable because evolutionarily, uh, and I'm not a big paleo person, but, uh, there are studies that show that paleo, uh, the average fiber intake during the paleolithic period was about hundred grams a day on about 3000 calories. So if you do the math, that's 3.3 grams per hundred calories for fiber. So on the average 2000 calorie diet, that should be a 66 grams of fiber a day, but yet the RDA is recommending 30 grams. So I find their, their, uh, their, their suggestion laughable. So on a very high fiber diet, why is that going to be important? Well, for one satiety, feeling full, you'll, you're, you should in theory eat less calories because you're filling up more on volume. But that, for me, that's not the most important part. Uh, fiber is fermented by the gut bacteria. And when, you're considering, when you consider this hypothesis of optimal bi uh, microbiome composition, which fiber obviously plays a role in because the gut microbes are almost exclusively uh, feeding on fiber. I mean, they feed on other stuff, but if you're going to give them 100 grams of fiber a day and they're seeing one or two grams of polyphenols and catechins or whatever other compounds that they feed on, it's just by mass action, fiber is going to dramatically outnumber everything else. So optimizing gut microbiome composition through a very high fiber diet. And then since the microbes change fiber into short chain fatty acids, these short chain fatty acids actually are fuel for our intestinal epithelial cells which help to keep our intestinal barrier function proper in, in, in that it, keep, it, it helps to keep stuff out of our blood that shouldn't be there. And intestinal barrier function decreases with age. So since you've got a high fiber diet that will uh, more, more than likely improve barrier function, now you're keeping microbial products and other stuff out of the blood, which in theory should reduce inflammation and, and even worse, microbes from being in the blood where they can get into your brain and your muscle and your tissues and all of that, uh, just as a brief aside, I don't know if you've seen the recent emerging data on microbes in the brain, and some of that information mm -hmm. was in my book, but uh, they've got to come from somewhere, whether it's the mouth or the gut, and uh, so, okay. So uh, just in terms of my own philosophy, this very high fiber diet, uh, I, I posit that, you know, uh, probably at least a 10% extension uh, in life slash health span, um, uh, and I'm trying to get every drip of the orange, you know, that I can to squeeze as much life out of, out of my own genetics that I can. So um, now where that'll take us to that getting that extra years of life, I'm kind of in that, you know, that Kurzweil uh, and Terry Grossman idea of live long enough to live forever. And I don't know that I, that's how it'll be, but I, I want to live as functionally uh, healthy and as, as, as functionally optimal as I can for as long as physically possible. And um, for now, I, you know, and I'm constantly tweaking things in my diet. Like when I get the blood test done, like I had 15 or so blood tests done in the last three years. Um, I'm constantly tweaking my diet to try to optimize my circulating biomarkers to keep my biological age low. Um, just as an example, uh, like my liver enzymes have been going up and that's pretty well documented in literature. Liver enzymes like ALT and ASD, they go up and they, they peak for about 10 or 20 years and they start to come down in later ages. So I noticed that my own had gone up and that drives me crazy because I don't like being on the I'm aging curve. Mm. So I, I noticed that there were things in my diet that were correlated both, both positively and negatively with my liver enzymes. So I started to make, try to make these changes. And uh, actually I've reduced my liver enzymes to about 25% uh, of where they were starting to trend towards. So, um, uh, yeah, I find a big impact of diet, not even going into my exercise routine for now, which is obviously going to have a huge role in this process too. But uh, this, it's a combination of everything, trying to stay lean, trying to make sure the biological age is young, trying to constantly change the diet to optimize the blood biomarkers, um, to try to get that extra 10 or 15 or even more years of life. Excellent. The love approach. Excellent. Excellent. Now that, 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 that's wonderful. And, you know, just, you know, leveraging off of that, because you are, as you know, as I began, you're, you're a big proponent uh, of, you know, the theme of biologic age tracking and, and really monitoring, as you know, you said at the beginning, there's literally potentially hundreds of biomarkers and, and different things one could be looking at, uh, you, you know, simultaneously, you mentioned you biome, but you, you don't, uh, you know, watch the news lately without seeing about some new do-it-yourself consumer-based 
um, bio tracking approach uh, in terms of microbiome screening and, and, and other let's say biologic outputs. Um, what are your feelings about this whole area? Are there things you recommend, don't recommend? Obviously one can, as you mentioned, AI before and in, in digging into a lot of this data, um, you know, where should we be? Should we be uh, splurging for, for lots of tests? Are there specific things you would recommend today for, for the average person? Uh, what are your thoughts on this whole area? Because I know this is uh, something that you're passionate about within your research program. Yeah, sure. So. I started, I started with the genome, something as simple as 23andMe, which is a $100 or less uh, test, just spit test. But uh, it doesn't give you the full genome. And then when you consider that uh, even if you had your full genome sequenced, the genome was, human genome was only sequenced, sequenced in 2001. So at best, there's, only, there's less than 20 years of data. Uh, and, and that's at best. Now, to get some huge epidemiological studies will show certain genes was uh, unlikely. So genomics is going to play a huge role in this process in terms of diagnosing uh, risk and potential incidence of disease. But I've actually downgraded that in my approach just because it's going to take a very long time to have enough data to do something about it. So then in terms of the, the, the biomarkers that I look at, uh, it's basically the simple chem screen and a metabolic panel. So this is something that you go and get when you go to your doctor uh, once a year and they'll give you just the yearly physical. So I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and, and it's basically like a $35 blood test that I order it online. But even without that, the, the individual tests that are on the metabolic panel plus CBC, the about 40 different blood test variables, they've been studied for 50 to 100 plus years. So there's a ton of data of which way do these things change with age? How are they related to uh, risk, of, uh, risk of death from disease? So it's, I wouldn't say it's easy because I think most people don't know, you know, if you said albumin, most people wouldn't know, which, is it high, is it low, which way should it go? Is it in the range, is it out of range? But I've studied the literature extensively on all of, the, uh, all of these 40 markers and uh, I have a very good idea of which way they should go. And these things like aging.ai, which look at biological age, verify that because the patterns that reflect an older biological age are exactly the things how I understand them in the literature without the program. So, um, so, so yeah, I think biological aging is, uh, tracking is essential. Um, now that said, the aging.ai isn't perfect. Um, the age range that they used to track, uh, uh, train their data was based up to about 80. So if you've got a blood uh, a biomarker set from someone that's 100, and, I, and I've tried it and I've put their data in, it doesn't come up like 100-year-old blood. It comes up as 70-year-old blood when, you know, hmm. It's like an albumin of three and red blood cells of 3.8, which are dramatically horrible, very low n numbers where they should be in the other direction. It, the aging AI is not perfect because, like I said, it, it hasn't been trained on a data set above 80 years old. Also, um, it's, its correlation coefficient, coefficient in predicting biological aid was about 0.8, which perfectly linear is one. So 0.8 may not be gr the greatest. Now, I don't want to knock aging.ai because I find the resource invaluable. Things like the epigenetic clock mm. are actually have been shown to be uh, have stronger correlations. But the current cost for one epigenetic uh, uh, clock test is three hundred dollars. Mm. So I'm not trying to bankrupt myself or anybody else that would want to do this. I want to make this a mass interest thing where people can just spend as little as possible. Even the dietary tracking software that I use is free, and it could cost me money, but I. I choose not to have it cost me money by manually inputting my own data every day. Mm. So the more people that can have access to these uh, easily affordable or relatively easy, easily affordable so they can measure reproducibly many times over time, um, that should help us all, you know? So, uh, so yeah, but eventually I really do see it. I see it as a, a mix of all of the omics in a machine learning environment and we'll have predictive algorithms that will say, okay, based on all these factors, you shouldn't exercise that past that much, or you shouldn't take in that much saturated fat, or you shouldn't eat that much meat. But we're nowhere near that. But that, with that in mind, I try to use my rudimentary stone hammering on the wall to try to do that the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. so, until it's, until it's, you know, real deal, you know, so however long Absolutely. it may be. Absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. It makes a lot of logical sense. And yeah, I'm, I'm also a big proponent that we, we have to come in an era where 
we have wonderful technologies, but they're getting more and more expensive to look for some of these, uh, <clears throat> let's say more common sense ways to get things done. Uh, you know, there's a hundred years that we, we've been through and there are a lot of great tools out there and we don't always have to think about, you know, the next big thing is a you know, million dollar, you know, check we have to write at some point for, yeah. there's just, there's just common sense ways of getting things done. But that's the beauty of the metabolic panel plus CBC uh, chem chemistry screen because it's a $35 test, $35 test online. Right. And basically it's uh, or 10 or $15 if you use your copay, if you go once a year to your doctor. Um, and it tests for the health of basically all of the organ systems, liver, kidney, cardiovascular risk. Um, it doesn't include things like cancer markers, but I mean, for a few hundred extra dollars, uh, which is still, it adds up over time, uh, you can add things in to improve the power of what you're looking at. Um, or inflammation markers, you know, these are things that aren't included but can be included and still would bring uh, the, the total cost down compared to these other things, you know, like the genome for $1,000 or, uh, you know, the $300 epigenetic test that you can only do once, so. Excellent, yeah, I agree, very much agree with that. Um, when it, one area I wanted, I, I know it's not the center of what you focus on, but, you know, when one looks at the sort of this 100 trillion uh, organism sort of mass that represents our personal microbiome. Um, you have this sort of subset of the, the virome. Um, and I don't know what the current figures are. I think it's something like, you know, the estimate is that uh, eight to 9% of all the, the, the DNA in our bodies across our 50 trillion cells is, is viral. Uh, and while we have these, um, you know, you think HIV and herpes and hepatitis and all this nasty stuff, um, there is, you know, a body of work that shows that there's literally a vast array of viruses out there that are extremely beneficial for us. Um, and, you know, in many ways, you know, we wouldn't have gotten here as, as homo sapiens if it wasn't for them. And then you have all these interesting uh, studies. You know, there was one recently with this sort of this uh, hepatitis G or this uh, GBVC virus that, you know, shown that, you know, People with HIV that are also, you know, have this infection have, uh, you know, a slower uh, clinical progression of disease. And when they looked at this in the laboratory, you see, you know, the way these, this other virus is capable of uh, impacting interferon and interleukins and, and, and certain cell receptors for HIV. And so there's this whole other sort of dimension of stuff going on at the viral level. I'm just wondering, do you are you focusing at all on any of this? You know, what are your feelings in terms of sort of viromic research, where that's going? Uh, you'd love to hear your, your top line on this area. So what's sad is that uh, microbial identification uh, science is very slow. In term, so, you know, originally the field was, was just studying the bacterial portion of our microbiome and mostly in the gut. And then it's only been recently that studies uh more studies on you know even the microbiome the fungi the virome you know viruses um have become more numerous but even with just looking at only the virome in isolation whether it's the gut or elsewhere in the blood for example like craig venter's group did it, uh human longevity um our microbiome all works together and also in concert with our own dna we are a super organism that's symbiotic for the most part so um how many years is it going to take where we're not just looking at only the bacterial portion of our microbiome and not even looking at how it affects the host or, you know, we've got to come, you know, uh, it's going to take time obviously because these things evolve slowly, but eventually science is going to have to get to the point where it's integrating all of the data from, from the microbiome and how it affects host health and that, and that, that communication between host and, and, uh, and biome. So that's, that's step one. So step two that I have in, in, in mind when you uh, raised that issue was um, not all microbes are, are pathogenic. You know, they're clearly bad actors. But even the bad actors, I'd argue it's just something, you know, it's, it's, it's random in some ways. For example, um, germ-free mice live longer than conventionally raised, which clearly shows a role for the microbiome on, on affecting lifespan. So, but they're not immortal. So why should... So, so there's, there's the disconnect there. Clearly the microbiome affects lifespan, but then there's something also that limits our own lifespan. And what would that be? It's obvious, decreased cellular function. So um, the, the microbiome composition and potentially functions is going to be a measure of 
the environment it's exposed to. So for example, there are microbes in space. There are microbes deep in volcanoes. There are microbes miles of, uh, in the ocean, miles deep in the ocean. These are microbes that have evolved based on those specific environments. Not all microbes can get into that, only some that have evolved that, right? So um, when you consider that, with a decrease in cell function through our own aging of our cells, the microbiome is gonna change based on that, that indirectly. But then also you've got, uh, potentially there are pathogenic microbes that are there even at a young age that may bloom during various conditions that would also negatively affect our cell function. So it's a two-way street there. So um, what I actually can see happening is uh, one, obviously the rejuvenation based approach to rejuvenate our own cells, but re the rejuvenation approach without factoring in how it would affect the microbiome in my eyes is going to be doomed for failure. It's too reductionist. Um, and then two is uh, vaccination. I see vaccination and, and as I mentioned, immuno rejuvenation as being very huge in terms of improving human health and disease um, related stuff. Like just as I mentioned in the book, you know, our lifespans have doubled in the past hundred or so years with the advent of the things that have reduced our own microbial burden. So would we get a corresponding doubling of, well, which it's unlikely, but at least another 20 or 30 or 40 years closer to the maximum of 120 uh, with an improved tolerance through vaccination to some of these uh, microbes that affect us in aging, you know, uh, E. coli, Staph aureus, uh, the herpes viruses. So um, that's where I can see it going. But unfortunately there aren't, you know, the, there aren't people really, there aren't enough scientists studying these microbes, quote unquote, of aging, because it isn't thought of in that way. It's, it's such a new and emerging thought. So um, that's part of the reason I wrote the book is to spread the word, to spread awareness, to try to wake people up, to get people thinking about it. And if it takes 50 years, it takes 50 years, but at least, you know, I'm playing a small role in, in yelling to the world that this is what's going on in other tissues. It's more, more than likely going on in aging. So we need to get involved now. So Absolutely. And, and, and it's great that you're, you're on the forefront of doing it. So that's, you know, I take my hat off to you. Hat well, I'm trying, but, you know, science is, is, a, is probably the most competitive, uh, one of the most competitive businesses in the world. And my grade oh, yeah. is up at the end of next year or at the early next year. So I'm working like a dog trying to get more grant funding to do more studies. So, I mean, hopefully I'm still in the game. You know, I want to be in this field for, you know, eternity, but, uh, that's how it goes well hopefully this this uh, this will help you spread the word further so Great. um so so okay so veering now a little bit away from science and uh and more towards science fiction uh idea me likes to uh throw this question out to uh to everyone we interview uh, whether it's in health or agriculture or the environment um mike i'm gonna pull a time machine out of my closet here that i've been working on uh, you can use this time machine, go anywhere you want. You can travel to the past or the future and talk to one person, ask them any questions you want. Who is that person? What are you going to ask them? Man, so, so I'm definitely not going in the past because that's not going to help. So I've got to go in the future. But then to identify one person wouldn't be enough, right? And I'd have to travel far enough into the future where aging was conquered. So I can't really pinpoint a person, but... Uh, so especially like I've heard Aubrey uh, de Grey say this, right? So there's a, there's a constant rate of aging. You know, it can be faster or slower based on, you know, diet and exercise and whatever the factors. But let's, there's a co pretty constant rate of aging. So where are we in understanding that constant of aging? Are we this close? Because if we're this close, we're pretty close to understanding aging and impacting it so that we can flatten the curve. So now there is no aging. So if, it's only a matter of time. If we're down here in the dark ages, it's gonna take many years to get up to there. So I'd have to travel far enough in time to where that those two curves have matched and then aging has been flattened. So I don't know, I mean, I'd have to probably go uh, to play it safe a thousand years in the future because if I can only have one shot at this time machine, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go like uh, fry in Futurama and not go far enough. <laughs> and then I'm just, I woke up tomorrow, that's my time machine, right? So uh, yeah, I'd probably go a thousand years in the future and uh, see, what uh, my thousand year old self is doing and how I've conquered aging and then uh, bring that message back. But that's true. I mean, science fiction, you know, uh, nobody's lived past 120. So it, we'd have to do some serious, you know, aging ass kicking in the next uh, 70 plus years to get that done.
uh, I'm sure between uh, all, all the, the minds that are working on it, uh, especially with someone like you, we're going to get there. But when you mentioned Aubrey de Grey, I thought you were going to you were going to see how long his beard was a thousand years from now. <laughs> uh. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike. I, once again, I really appreciate you spending your Sunday uh, coming on the show and talking. Um, I'd like to basically wrap things up, give you the forum once again to uh, to pitch your book, your websites, your uh, scientific work at Tufts. Um, any messages you want to get out there? Uh, we're going to put the all your links uh, to these things on the uh, the interview website. But um, you can finish up, have the floor, uh, you know, pitch anything you want. Um, but it's it's been a real pleasure having you. Thanks, Ar. Same here. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, uh, I've got the book out there. It's on Amazon. Just you can Google it. Uh, um, I've got my blog where actually I just posted something today on resting heart rate and uh, how I've reduced it over time, which it actually increases over time, and how I've done that. Um, you can get me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and at some point I'm going to have my own YouTube channel uh, doing all kinds of uh, interesting stuff related to my diet and exercise and articles that I've written, trying to you know, spread it out like that too. So, uh, and then email. I mean, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty, uh, I try to get back to as many people as possible. I try not to be that scientist that blows off uh, anybody. I don't want to be that person. So yeah, I'm pretty easy to access. So if anyone's got questions or comments, they can, you know, just shoot me an email or a tweet or Facebook message, however they want to, and, uh, have a conversation. So great. Wonderful. So everybody that's, that's Dr. Mike Lesgarten, his book, Microbial Burden, Major Cause of Aging and Age-Related Disease and What We Can Do to Fight Back. Uh, he's truly uh, a human that is shaping big ideas for the world today and the future. And everybody get out there, follow him, learn what he's doing because it is really fascinating stuff. And um, once again, thanks so much for being here, Mike. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you and hopefully get the message out there. Thanks so much for being here. Have a good one. Take care. You too.